Hi, it's Dr. Lori. Can you pick the most valuable object? You know, I choose all of these diverse objects because this is what you find when you're in the thrift store. You're at the flea market, the yard sale. You know, you've got, you know, a big bowl next to something else, next to, you know, a toy car, whatever it might be. So first object, here we go. Can you pick the most valuable? And you might find these anywhere. When you're doing online shopping, maybe you find them there. Okay, here's the first object. This object is a Mickey Mouse pocket watch, right? Now you're all like, oh, but it's a Mickey Mouse wristwatch, Mickey Mouse wristwatch. We hear all about the Mickey Mouse wristwatches. This is a pocket watch. Also by the Ingersoll company, when Ingersoll and of course Walt Disney teamed up to market to children, right? So Disney, usually high values, right? So you think about that. I want you to look at the watch. I want you always to look at the foundation of the object. Look at the pieces. Look at the foundation of the object because that's going to tell you whether or not you've got something valuable, okay? So here's what I want you to look for. I want you to look for condition. I want you to look for to see whether or not it's working, right? I want you to see if you have all the hands because lots of pocket watches lose their hands or the crystal, right, or the back. So you want to make sure that it's in pretty good shape. Now, if you look there at the bottom dial, there are two, there's the big face, then there's the bottom dial with the small little Mickeys, not in terrific shape, right? So you might think about this particular piece, how valuable is it compared to others that you might see online or what they're asking for it at the thrift store or at the flea market or at the antique shop. So you want to think about all of those things. This particular piece is a really nice piece and it's a good piece of memorabilia from the 1930s. They market them into the 1940s. Most Disney collectibles are going to be collectible because people are interested in Disney and of course the main guy in Disney is right here, Mickey Mouse. Value on the piece, $250 in this condition, right? If it's in great condition, you're gonna see it going upwards of about $500. But this example, 250 bucks in this condition. All right, here's the next one. This is a Wolverine toy. You're like, a Wolverine toy? I'm a Wolverine, you all know that. I went to school in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and they're the Michigan Wolverines, right? Um, great football team, and a lot of fun there, and a lot of drinking, and a lot of not doing your homework. <laughs> a lot of stuff going on at Michigan on those days. Anyway, this is a Wolverine toy. Wolver Wolverine is the actual toy manufacturer, and this is a child's refrigerator. It's made of lithographic tin. So when you look at this piece, I want you to think about a couple of things. When you look at a piece like this, I want you to automatically say, oh, that's got to be the 1950s. Why? Lithograph tin toys on metal were very popular in the 1950s. So these are the types of sort of clues that I want you to know so you can identify date. So you can have a, a leg up on anybody else who's looking at these pieces when you're out shopping. So this particular example is a refrigerator. So you see all the food on one side and then you can see in fact the way in which it opens up. It's got the freezer and then the shelves for the inside of the refrigerator. And it would be like a, a play set for kids and you could have the refrigerator and they had the stove and all different things in the 50s so you can sort of have your your mock you know kitchen so this particular piece has some problems with respect to condition right so this is where you need a tetanus shot you know your little kid's going to need a tetanus shot if they touch that piece of of course metal that's now rusty so that's the other problem with this piece Condition is very, very key when it comes to evaluating the value. So when I'm doing an analysis for an online appraisal or an insurance appraisal or appraisals, you know, for anybody, I want, I remember and I look at this idea of condition because it is important. So look for the lithograph tin. Make sure you have the original hardware. So the hinges have to be original. Hinges have to be original. You have to have the original, you know, door opener, knobs, those kinds of things. Value on this piece, only $45. And the reason for it, condition, condition, condition. All right. The next piece is a ruby glass piece. It's ruby glass cut to clear. So cut glass in this particular case. I want to talk to you a little bit about cut glass because you, all of you ask me about glass. You ask me about glass all the time. I get questions about glass. I get inquiries on, you know, the online appraisals when you send me a photo about glass uh, at my big public events about glass, on my video chats about glass, 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 what, what do I know? Uh, ruby glass cut to clear, cranberry glass cut to clear. They're a little bit different, a little different color, but that idea of putting, in fact, a piece of red, having a piece of red glass, and then again, another piece of glass, 
basically where they will put the glass on top of one another and then they'll cut through it to reveal whatever kind of glass is underneath. So this particular piece is all the same, you know, clear glass. This piece is all the same, of course, pink glass. But when you think about cut to clear glass, it's two layers of glass of two different colors. So there is going to be red glass and then clear glass. And then when you cut through the clear glass, you're going to reveal the red and vice versa. When you cut through the red, you're going to reveal the clear. So that's why it's called cut to clear glass. This kind of glass is also popular in from anywhere between like the 1860s all the way up until like the 1960s. And this particular piece is a good example of how you can see this type of cut glass attention to detail come in the form of um, perfume bottles and other sort of accessory pieces, uh, whether it's jars or perfume bottles for the dresser. This pieces have high value because it's high quality. Value on it, 175 bucks. So remember, when you have to put in um, a relatively uh, important type of function or manufacturing, when you have to actually cut these pieces away, takes time, takes expertise, you have to have someone who's an artist who can master the cutting away process, then in fact you see the value goes up. So if somebody has to do a job well, value usually goes up, particularly with antiques. These weren't mass produced in large numbers, but you can see a lot of them out there. Now, next piece. This piece speaks to history. I say this all the time. I always say, you know what, if it speaks to history, if some object tells you something about a historical time period or a place or um, a, uh, what we're thinking about or what culture is like in a particular time, then it's going to be worth money. So I always say that and you've got to remember this. This particular piece is a piece called, you know, for England and democracy. This is a tea kettle. You know, I'm American. What do you think about when you think about the Brits? Well, I lived in Great Britain for um, a time uh, a long time ago and worked for the BBC. And when I was there, I basically was living in London in a place near called Hammersmith, called Fulham, on a, on a tube line. And as a young person working in London and living in London, you started to kind of realize just how the same we are and just how different we are when we live in different countries. So the reason why I bring this up is that, you know, I would hear stories of my friends and their grandparents who had lived through World War II, who had lived through the bombings, and how it was so important for their victory gardens to be growing, how it was so important for them to save their extra pennies in a teapot or a tea kettle. I used to get in trouble all the time when I lived with this one family because I would pull out the plug. They had electric tea kettles and the kettle was always going with hot water. And I grew up, you know, with turn out, pull out the plug, turn off the light, don't, you know, raise the thermostat. You know, I was brought up in that kind of home. So I would always, I was always pull out the plug of the tea kettle and they'd always get mad at me going, who turned out the tea kettle, you know, in their British accent. And I'd be like, oh yeah, it was me. Because they love their tea all day long and that, that kettle is always heating up hot water and it was electric. Anyway, I digress. Here's what I want to tell you about this particular teapot. This teapot, it's not electric. This teapot, of course, is ceramic. And it was a teapot that was actually carried by the Royal Navy, right, to the United States. And it's marked that way on the bottom. And this particular pot was basically saying, this is what Americans are thinking about the Brits. We're thinking about, you know, how can we get them back to enjoying tea and get them back to a time period, to a, a, a phase where everybody's happy and there's no more war. So this is a representation, a very, very strong visual representation for people who lived through World War II in the from 1938 to 1945, who lived through that particular and terrible war, particularly in England that this particular teapot says, this is what we can do if we band together. So it, it's tea, save a little bit of, save your pennies, and it's for England and democracy. Very, very important. Now, here's why I wanna bring this particular piece up, because this piece is worth $55, but I saw one selling online for $488. Now, oh my gosh, Dr. Lurie, you just told me that it's worth $55. It is worth $55. Actual sales records have shown this teapot sell regularly at about $55. This person who's, who's putting it up on eBay to sell it is thinking, I'm gonna ride the World War II wave. There's somebody out there who's gonna pay me a lot of money, a lot more than its market value for this piece. They don't care. They're gonna say it's worth $488. They're gonna say it's worth almost 500 bucks. Well, I wouldn't say that because that's not an appraised value. What that is, is that's 
what I always say it, a wish, a hope, a price, a dream. That's what it is. It's basically, they could price it in anything. There's somebody out there who wants to pay that much for it. All of a sudden, then people will say, oh, okay, well, somebody paid that for it. Nobody's paid that for it at this point. It's just somebody who has the guts to say, I want to put up a price of 488. And even if somebody does pay 488 for this particular teapot that's only worth $55, guess what? It's still not worth that. Oh, but wait a minute, Dr. Lori, you said that if somebody pays that much, then it's worth that much. Well, that's true, but you have to have significant and consistent values in a particular range, right? So good appraisers would say, wow, that's sky high. That's not happening most of the time. And oh, that's really low. They don't sell for just $5. The ones that sell in the middle in that $55 gains for $50, for $55, for $60, those are the ones, those are the established market value. Others are the flukes. And you have to think about the flukes and you have to be able to recognize and analyze what the market is actually doing. Sometimes there are people, particularly online, who are trying to either discredit or misidentify these particular objects. So that one, 55 bucks if you're going to resell it. Somebody's going to try for 488, but that's not really what it's worth. The next one is something that a lot of you know and recognize, old bottles. I hear about you guys always asking me about old bottles. So old bottles are really popular and there are a lot of them. A lot of different, re a lot of different reasons why you collect old bottles. So some of the reasons why people tell me that they collect old bottles, they collect cobalt bottles, or they collect apothecary bottles because their dad was a pharmacist, or they collect bitters bottles, and that's what this is. This is a bitters bottle, and at the bottom it says bitters on it, and you know that bitters are used, in fact, to enhance the flavor of cocktails, usually. Some people will use bitters and drink a little bit of bitters if they have an upset stomach, and it will usually give a bitter or sour taste. Oftentimes, it is mixed into mixed drinks. Okay, so what are you looking for when you're looking for bottles? First of all, color is going to be very important, right? The other thing that's going to be important is if there's any decoration that is embossed. That means it actually looks like it's pushed out or, or pressed in. In this particular case, the word bitters and all of that detailing around the actual object, around the corners of this particular object. This object you can also see has a cork in the top and the cork is gonna be important too. If you have the original cork, wow, that's gonna increase value. But this particular one dates between about 1900 and about 1910, relatively old. Seams. When you look for bottles, I want you to look about seams. Seams will tell you a little bit about age. Seams will also tell you about the construction of it. And sometimes, like with Coca-Cola bottles, they might even give you an impression and tell you, in fact, where was that bottle? You know, like the, the all uh, elusive Rochester bottle, the one from the Rochester Bottling Company that people are looking for with respect to Coca-Cola. But that's a different example. So when you're looking at bitters bottles like this one, I want you to look for color. Why? Well, on a bitters bottle and on many bottles, the reason why you have a bottle that's not clear like this vase is because you don't want the light to get in because if the sunlight gets in to that particular chemical, it could change the properties of the chemical. So you wanna be aware of that. The liquid could change its properties if there's too much sunlight or too much light in general. So they'll make a lot of these bottles of a color, cobalt color, for example, or this nice brown color, amber color, and, and the like. All right, this next piece is really kind of interesting too. Would you know what it's worth? That bitters bottle, by the way, is worth 65 bucks. So would you know what this next one's worth? This is an image of Amsterdam, and this particular image is a example of the imagery that you would see in the great Dutch master period. So when's that, Dr. Lori? Well, the Dutch masters are people like Rembrandt and people like Ruisdael and others, Vermeer, and they are working in the 1600s, the middle part of the 1600s, in places like Holland. Okay, so you've got this particular piece, and this particular piece is about a 10 inch in diameter. You have to think about dimensions. You have to think about size when you are looking at these pieces. If you're shopping online, I want you to really investigate size. If someone who is selling something online doesn't tell you the actual dimensions of a piece, ask for them. And ask to see the back too. There's a lot of information revealed on the back of a plate just like this. For this particular plate, the back says Delft, Bach. It also says, in fact, um, the maker. Now, it's signed on the front, 
F.J. Du Chatel. And that particular maker is the person who actually painted the blue-white scene that you see here with the nice windmill and, of course, the waterway, you know, the low countries, if you would call them. And they, are, of course, have all different kinds of waterways going through them if you've been to places like Belgium or Amsterdam or such. So that's what we're looking at here. It's a Delft blue-white plate. Look at the patterning around the perimeter or around the rim. That's going to be important for value as well. Do you know what this one's worth? Let me tell you one more thing. It's from the 1950s, so it's not that old. Hmm, now what do you think? Are you thinking? All right, from the 1950s, even, and it's only, of course, uh, 50, 70 years old, it's worth $175 because of the craftsmanship with respect to the painting, as well as the size of the porcelain plate, as well as the fact that it's indicative of what we think of when we think of Delft or blue-white ceramics. So remember that. That becomes extremely important. If something looks like it's of a type, it's going to be more valuable. And these particular ideas, you know, these kinds of videos that I'm doing for you, I'm doing them so you understand about the diversity and so you can kind of shift gears. So what do I mean shifting gears? You're in the, you're in the thrift store, you're in the flea market, you're at the antique show, whatever it is, and you're seeing all different types of objects. If everything was the same, right? If everything was a cookie jar from the 1960s, you'd have an easier time of identifying which is more valuable. You know, what looks like quality, what looks like the condition is good, what looks like it was, it was painted or glazed better, right? But when you're looking at in a thrift store or a flea market, when there's all this different stuff, you start to have a harder time of it, which is why these videos are for to help you to sort of identify and then guess, you know, which is the most valuable. Okay, how about some costume jewelry? You knew I wouldn't forget the jewelry, right? <laughs> so costume jewelry in this particular case. This is a pair of Kenneth J. Lang, Kenneth J. Lang earrings. Called Aracondas are basically very, very long earrings very, very long hanging earrings that are very, very popular, mainly in places like Mexico and part of the Caribbean, uh, the south of France. And these were costume jewelry, and Kenneth J. Lane was very well known in the middle to the late 1900s for, of course, giving costume jewelry and, and allowing costume jewelry to be worn by starlets, right? Movie stars, the Elizabeth Taylors and the Joan Crawfords of the time. These are from the 1960s, and this pair is Faux, you know, faux, right? Faux, F-A-U-X, faux or false, of course, colorless stones trying to look like diamonds. And then these other chalcedony stones, which are those blue stones, also fake, but trying to look like chalcedony stones. And they are actually in that nice, of course, sort of marquee kind of feel, that kind of oval um, cut. And they're, again, hanging earrings. Very, very good condition. You know, costume jewelry, you have to look for good condition. If you turn these over, they have a post, right? They have a post that's going to go through a pierced ear, so they are not clip-ons, which makes them a little bit higher in value, right? And they also are one continuous, one continuous setting in the back. And then that one continuous setting is actually placed, each stone is placed within that setting. So you're not getting little piecemeal, and then you have to put everything together. So that's one of the things you want to look for for value as well when it comes to costume jewelry, particularly the construction of earrings when you have a post earring or a pierced earring. What do you think they're worth? For the pair. And if you don't have a pair, nowadays people are wearing just one earring and have been for a long time. So not having a pair, while it's always good to have a pair for earrings, you know, not having a pair is not as big a deal as it was maybe 10 years ago. Value on this pair of earrings, about $150 retail. So did you guess which one is the most valuable? Do you know what's it worth? Basically, I want you to learn what you're looking for with different objects because that's what you're usually up against when you're shopping at the thrift store, the flea market, or the yard sale. I'm Dr. Lori. Thanks for watching. There'll be more videos coming up. See you next time.